All right, welcome to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin. I'll be in your instructor this semester. So this is lecture one, introduction. So jumping right to the point, I think this class is a lot of fun. So as you can tell, perhaps from the version number on the problem set and the final project specification, uh, we've been running this course for eight semesters now, eight years now. So it's certainly seen a lot of changes over time. And I think that the projects in particular are what make this course particularly fun, at least for me. I've never sat where you've sat, so you can tell me come four months from now if, I, if I'm a little off the mark here. But this is very much, I think, a developer's course. It's a course for folks who really want to get their hands dirty with some uh, perhaps unfamiliar technologies, if you will, XML being the umbrella under which we'll work this entire semester, getting exposure to various tools. One of the most compelling features, as we'll discuss tonight as in, and in future lectures, is that one of the most compelling features about XML is quite simply the fact that so many freely available tools, so many well-developed tools, so many off-the-shelf tools exist for it. And the fact of the matter is that XML and all of its derivatives that we'll look at this semester allow you to get work done often more quickly, more effectively, because you can really integrate into your own work some off-the-shelf solutions. And you'll see that there are a number of problems that XML addresses or solves all of which have been solved in other ways. Dare say better, dare say worse ways in the past, but it solves them in different ways and in a manner that's simply increasingly popular, again, because of the widely available tools and, frankly, because of the human readability of it all. So we'll certainly touch on those themes tonight and throughout the semester. So there's certainly been a lot of hype over the years. Um, though fortunately it's beginning to dwindle as folks appreciate that XML is little more at the end of the day than open tag, close tag, it's just a text file format. But here are some funny ones that we've pulled over the time. XML is a content rich, data neutral file format. It's probably the most important new technology development over the last two years, of the last two years. It's a bit of a bold statement for something that at the end of the day is again, Open tag, close tag. This one, I don't even know what this means. An idea almost as good as peanut butter and chocolate. This from the XML EDI group. And finally, this one I think is just over the top, completely perhaps playing on the other one. A spreading ooze of data will expand as people exchange data more easily with XML. So perhaps a bit histrionic, that last one in particular, but it, been, it has been interesting over the past few years just seeing how increasingly common XML is just in the general marketplace and in folk software. Any of you uh, who subscribe to RSS feeds are subscribing to flat file XML files. Any of you who use iTunes podcasts are simply subscribing to XML files. Any of you who use Ant as a build tool are using XML-based configuration files. So whatever its upsides and downsides, the fact of the matter is, it's certainly quite popular. And the, the compelling feature about courses like this is that, again, there are so many tools, so many ways of actually using what on, face, uh, what on the surface is just a very simple text file format. So in fact, at the end of each semester, we typically ask our own students, say something, that, uh, say something interesting about XML. Well, what, if you were to advise next semester students as to what they'd get out of this course, what they should know about XML itself, well, what should they know? And two of the best quotes I think we've gotten last semester were these. XML's strength is its wide adoption and excellent tools. XML itself is not that interesting. I think quite humble and right to the point. And two, XML is a... <laughs> this, um, more artistic, this one. XML is very zen. If you get XML, it's rarely about the XML. It's about the data and the tools. If you don't get it, it's all about angle brackets and buzzword compliance. And those two quotes in particular really summarize what at least the content of this course is all about and simultaneously what we try for it not to be about. So what are the goals of this course? Well, at the end of the day, as sort of excited as I try to get over some of these things, we nonetheless try to cut through the so-called hype around these tools and around these angled brackets, but focusing again uh, in the spirit of a developer's course on practicality, like what do you actually need to know to actually get real work done on the applications? What um, tools are out there? What technologies are out there that you can literally incorporate into your own work? Again, in the spirit of getting work done. And then just possibilities. Among the, uh, among the goals of this course is not just to 
acquaint you intimately with a number of the most popular uses and technologies surrounding XML, but also to expose you to other things that are out there, other things that don't necessarily see uh, such wide adoption these days, but are at least are something to bear in mind and perhaps might satisfy some niche need of your own in your own work. The rewards of this course. So we do hope that you'll exit this course with just a solid understanding of the fundamentals, XML, its syntax, the validation thereof, and so forth. And we hope you get experience, so to speak. So among the languages and technologies and tools with which you'll exit this course experienced in are such things as the following. Uh, the first several being languages of sorts, DTD, SVG, uh, XML namespaces, XSLFO, XSLT, XQuery and such. Two programmatic interfaces to XML, namely SAX and DOM. And a lot of these acronyms and other buzzwords will actually tease apart over the next few weeks. But for now, know that these are things to come. JAXP and TRAX, these are Java specific APIs that let you get at XML content and they are incorporated into the latest um, J the latest Java standards from Sun Microsystems itself, Java server pages and Java servlet. So one of the um, one of the I think takeaways of this course that isn't necessarily clear from just the title alone is that what a number of our students exit this course with each semester is not only exposure and experience with a great number of these XML related technologies, but generally an exposure to and experience in server-side software development. Essentially, the latter half of this course, we spend using Java servlets and J JSPs, using a product called Apache Tomcat, which is both a web server and an application server. Um, a, uh, a very popular product, if you will, that is nonetheless freely available and actually used in fairly widely deployed um, server-based solutions today. And we'll look at some terms that are certainly more familiar to, at least in acronyms alone, HTTP, SOAP, Web Services, and WSDL. A great number of commercial providers like Amazon and PayPal and eBay and the like are providing developers with programmatic access to their data sets, to their functionality, and they're increasingly exposing these APIs by way of what are called web services, essentially publishing for the world to see what's at the end of the day just an XML file, a WSDL file in this case, that essentially describes the services, the methods, and the arguments there too that a developer can use, say at Amazon, in their own code. And what this XML file allows those developers to do literally is to dynamically generate the Java or the C Sharp or the C++ code that essentially implements precisely those methods or those functions, all in the spirit of what are ultimately remote procedure calls. So toward the end of the course, we'll dabble in a couple of lectures and one of the problem sets on these things called web services tools as well. The course itself is intended to be platform independent, but the fact of the matter is some of these tools are very much platform dependent. Um, none of them are commercial products except two that we use in the course, and even those are not required, but we'll introduce you to a cool tool called FOP, which is a, pro uh, which is a software package from Apache, freely available, that implements much of the XSL FO specification, which we'll see is a formatting oriented language. Uh, Tomcat, which I mentioned before, Zalin and Xerxes, which are really the de facto standards when it comes to uh, XML parsers and XSLT processors these days. Uh, at least one of these two are integrated into the JRE and JDKs that Sun Microsystems ships today. Um, and two commercial products, Stylus Studio and XML Spy, the latter being a particularly popular one, we've, um, we've arranged with the companies that produce these Windows-based programs for site licenses for students in this course for the next four or five months so that you can actually use unfettered versions of these programs really just to make your lives easier. These are essentially WYSIWYG type tools that allow you to mark up XML more effectively, whip up what's called XSLT more efficiently. And I'm tossing a lot of these terms out tonight, but we'll get to all of them. So certainly don't feel you need to even know at this point what an XSLT editor is. We'll tease each of these apart in the weeks to come. So before we dive into some actual material, our agenda tonight is, is fairly humble. Um, tonight's goal is to simply present some of the logistics of the course, set the expectations as to what you'd be getting yourself into, and then introduce some of the basics of XML. So that at the end of tonight, um, during which we'll probably exit um, early this evening, 
and I'll stick around for individual Q&A if you're still considering taking this particular course. Um, we'll introduce some of the fundamentals of XML and get some of the basics out of the way. And what we'll do in lectures two and three in the next two weeks is introduce two of the programmatic APIs to XML, namely SAX and DOM. And I'll also mention briefly the uh, roles of the six handouts that we've distributed tonight. But before we proceed, any questions thus far? Yeah. Sure. Perfect question. Working on a Mac platform, will that hamper your abilities to engage fully in the course? I would say no. I mean, those two products are quite popular on the Windows platform, but there do exist some Linux slash Mac OS oriented alternatives. So uh, certainly not. They're useful time saving tools, but I don't think you'll feel yourself at any sort of disadvantage. We historically have students using both Linux and Mac OS in great numbers in the course, in addition to Windows. And as you might have gathered from the camera in the back of the room here, not only are you folks considering or taking you to 59, we also have a good number of distant students, so to speak, tuning in via distance education for the weeks to come. So there are more of you out there whose names you'll probably see on the course's listserv, which we'll come back to in just a bit. So other questions, content or logistical? Anything at all? Oh, yeah. Sure. So this is perhaps the most oft-asked question about the course, because the, uh, the course catalog says comfort with XHTML or HTML and Java is assumed. Essentially, the course makes the assumption that all of you taking this course are programmers. So interpret as you will, for the most part. What we will assume is that you have the savvy to go about implementing something in Java where that something is prescribed by the problem set. I would say that certainly if I were to say, go implement a hash table in Java, you could come back in an hour or two's time and hand me the printouts of a hash table implementation in Java. That, I think, is the idea. And if I gather from your face and perhaps other faces here, oh, hash table, what? Um, or hash table, yes, but not in Java. We've absolutely had students in this course take the course with, say, just a semester's worth of Java experience at the Extension School, having taken just courses like uh, Computer Science E50A. Um, certainly, we've had students who come to the course with a familiarity with C Sharp and C++, and they simply pick up what they need to know. So I would say that the following, if you certainly think of yourself as a Java developer, and Java is among the languages on your CV, then you're probably fine where you are today. If you have less experience with Java and are perhaps more experienced with other languages, you too can certainly succeed in this course because we've had many students over the year in precisely that situation. I suspect they do just have to work a bit harder or work a bit more to bring themselves up to speed. I think then that the best way for you to get a quick sense of whether or not you belong in a course like this is after tonight, flip through the course's first project. Um, we don't expect that you even tackle this problem set, this project, until at least next week. So don't worry that you need to dive in starting tonight or this weekend. But it will give you a sense just in flipping through it as to the level of sophistication that we're at least assuming, since this pro project in particular is almost entirely Java. Based. Other questions? No? Okay, so let's see. So this course essentially has two halves to it. The first half is certainly um, is certainly guided by our interest in XML, but it's largely client-based. And by that, I mean the following. In the course's first project, which I just mentioned, you'll take the hood off of what's called an XML parser. And for tonight's purposes, an XML parser is just a piece of software that takes an XML file, which again is just a text file, and parses it character by character, and essentially informs you of the interesting aspects of that file by way of what are called SACS events, or by building a tree in memory, uh, like a binary sort tree or an n-ary tree in memory and then handing you the root of that tree. But again, we'll tease those two ideas apart in weeks two and three. Um, that's what an XML parser is. We'll give you in project one most of an XML parser, but lacking certain features. And the goal of this project in particular is to get your hands dirty with the inner workings of an XML parser and really appreciate from the bottom up exactly how the very tools that we'll be relying upon in future projects and in software development in general actually work, what the implications perhaps are for performance and such. But generally speaking, you'll really understand things having taken this course from the bottom on up. And you won't simply be 
tuning into the APIs necessarily at this sort of level. The second half of the course, beginning with projects three and four, is largely server-side based. So we essentially transition after project two to a server-side environment where you'll be using software like Apache Tomcat and actually deploying your own Java servlets and or JSPs and deploying generally your own websites using XML and several different forms to generate that content. For instance, a, a teaser of sorts before we'll come back to it in just a bit, Project, th project 3 is ultimately about building your own web portal, uh, sort of uh, jokingly referred to as Wahoo, where you'll have a portal that, stu that users can log into with the username and password, and then they'll be able to subscribe, quote unquote, to feeds of news, a la RSS, and they'll be able to add these feeds to their so-called favorites within the portal, and then we'll also challenge you with extending this portal to have some more personalized feature, maybe a live weather feed, maybe a live stock ticker feed, something that generally incorporates publicly accessible information into your own dynamic interface, entirely thus web-based. In Project 4, you'll implement what we've dubbed Scamazon.com, which is meant to be an e-commerce engine where you implement your own shopping cart, and the idea thereof, and you handle uh, the process of a user checking out, so to speak, and fulfilling their order, also using in that project what are called, again, web services. So our focus in the latter half of the course will be entirely server-side based, and to facilitate that, we'll introduce various components of what's generally known as J2 E, Java 2 Enterprise Edition. So as you'll see with Project 1, what we have you do at Courses Start is download, if you don't have it installed already, Java 2 Standard Edition, which, if unfamiliar, just means the basic um, software with which to run and compile Java code. Then we'll add, over the course of the semester, various components from what's known as SUN's J2EE standard, Enterprise Edition, which is simply lots of libraries, lots of packages that are simply more server-side focused. We could have you download the entirety of the J2EE uh, distribution, but it's just unnecessarily big, unwieldy, and it's all too easy to get distracted by all of the various Java doc APIs that would otherwise appear when we browse through it. So. The course, though, in the latter half is entirely about, in spirit, Java 2 Enterprise Edition. So even though there's this semantic difference between J2SE and J2EE, which you'll exit this course with at the end of the semester is an understanding of and a familiarity and experience in a number of popular components of J2EE. And as such, it isn't entirely server side at that point. Uh, for those unfamiliar, if I'm going quickly over things, uh, the sorts of Java-oriented things that we're assuming, you may certainly have at least seen something like this. If you have just a semesters or two savvy with Java, this is the Java doc for Java 2 Standard Edition, version 5.0, aka 1.5. And essentially all I mean is that we'll be making use of some of the libraries that ship with Java, so to speak, and adding additional libraries to it as well. All right. So... The XML, some of the what, where, why, when, how, and such things. So, well, actually, let me not skip ahead. You do have, granted, the, uh, the benefit of the answers in front of you on paper, but let me leave this blank for a moment and just ask you, the crowd, XML. Let's start with the lowest hanging fruit possible. What does it stand for? Not that acronyms are generally that interesting. Excellent. Extensible markup language. So in your own words, what is XML? Anyone? Tag-based language? Okay, what else? What can you use it for then with these tags and such? So you can use these tags to describe data. So as such, XML is ultimately about, is largely about metadata, the addition of data to your own data that somehow describes that data further but without actually changing the actual data you care about. And that's a lot of uses of the word data in our definition, but it should be more clear by example alone. Any other comments on just what? XML is, while you're here, you presumably have some suspicions. Well, let's try to summarize it with just these three top bullet points. It is a meta language in the truest sense in that it's a language for creating other languages. So XML at the end of the day really is all about angled brackets, open bracket, close bracket, and some stuff in between. But most of the languages, so to speak, or technologies or protocols that we look, in this look at in this course are XML-based, 
like XSLT, but that's just because they happen to share this common file formatting of what we know as XML. So XML in and of itself, as one of our students said, it's just not that interesting. But it's these other languages that are defined within the, the confines of that relatively simple specification where you actually get some useful functionality and tools. So XML lets you define schemas for tag-based languages. So what that means, and we'll revisit this in the lecture on our lectures on DTD and our lecture on what's called XML schema, is that what is particularly nice about XML is that you can very precisely specify what it should look like. So one of the most common uses for XML these days is in the sharing of information from one party to another. What's nice about XML is that it comes with this inherent ability to describe in XML itself even, using XML schema, exactly what that data should look like. The upside for developers is that if I'm receiving a nightly data feed from party B and I'm party A, I can quote unquote validate that incoming feed against what's called a schema or DTD. And again, using some pre-existing off-the-shelf but well-defined tools, my own system that's relying on that data can simply, right at the point of entry, say, no, this document is not quote-unquote valid if that input data simply violates the schema, so to speak, that we have defined a priori before even receiving that data. So none of this is magic. You could certainly do that sort of data validation yourself for the past 20 plus years with any higher level language. But the fact of the matter is these kinds of features are built into this world of XML. And that, frankly, tends to have value, especially if you want to do things quickly. Finally, and perhaps most usefully about XML itself, is that it is extensible, as its own acronym suggests. And what this means is that you can often take an existing document in XML and add data to it, that is extend it, and add additional metadata to it without breaking the software that relies on that data because of these tags. And we'll see an example of that in just a moment. So what if we meant to be clear about XML schemas? Well, using this language of DTD or XML schema, as we'll see in the weeks to come, you can define very precisely what it means to be a stock transaction, a document that simply represents a buy, a sell, or some other such action. But you can represent what that piece of data should look like. A uh, business document, a purchase order, is something we'll rely on in our own project four. Remote procedure calls is something we'll also look at in lecture and in project four. SOAP being an example of one RPC uh, oriented XML derivative and then configuration files. And this is one of the, you know, dare say silly compelling features of XML, the fact that it makes writing configuration files easier. But the fact of the matter is, especially if you're well versed in the Unix world, every program written over the past 20 years seems to have its own file format for configuration files, whether it's for your email program, your newsreader program, uh, Pine itself, uh, ProcMail, SendMail, PostFix, any of these utilities over the years, they've just developed their own configuration file formats. And that's fine because we've always had the ability to write software that parses those file formats, but it's just yet another thing to implement yourself. What you see increasingly, and this I do think is compelling, are programs like Ant and Eclipse and other popular software products simply migrating toward XML-based configuration files because they too can take an off-the-shelf implementation of that thing called an XML parser and just be spoon-fed, literally, the data in that file in a very easily processable form. And that alone, and I would not switch over your entire uh, infrastructure to XML because configuration files are easier to implement, but it's these kinds of things that at least make me, as a sort of hobbyist programmer often, just reach for these kinds of tools and these kinds of formats because, again, it makes the development cycle faster and just more reliable because you can rely on products that other people have made that have been well vetted by the community. All right, so where do all of these XML derivatives, as I've been calling them, come from. So they come from down the road. The World Wide Web Consortium, aka the W3C, the Tim Berners Lees and such of the world. And essentially their process works very slowly in this order. And I introduced this not because the bureaucracy of the W3C is interesting, but because as we look at the so-called recommendations, aka specifications for XML, XSLT, XML schema, all of these XML oriented languages this year, each of them is always tagged with its status. 
And seeing that its status is in quote unquote recommendation status, which oddly enough means it's a standard, not so much a recommendation, just means that you can trust that this specification is not going to change. And if XML 1.1 looks like this because that's what the recommendation says it does, you can at least trust that any software or any tools that support XML 1.1 support precisely this implementation. By contrast, if a language or protocol is in sort of an earlier phase of specification, it's in any of these other uh, possible statuses, proposed recommendation, candidate recommendation, last call working draft, working draft. And you've seen this over the years with things like XML query, which is supposed to be sort of a SQL-like, though that's a bit of an abuse of the analogy, uh, language for querying XML data. And for years, it, it sort of floundered in this area here. And even to date, the support for XML query or XQuery just really isn't quite there yet. Um, even languages like XSLT, which we'll introduce in weeks four and five in great detail, are, XSLT 2.0 has been in recommendation status, yet there really isn't widespread adoption of that language either. So one of the languages we'll focus on in this course is actually version 1.0 of that. Not because it's better. In fact, 2.0, as you might expect with newer versions, does have newer features that are compelling, but just no one seems to support it just yet, other than one of the guys on the committee who's very well renowned and has written one of the course's recommended textbooks. But by contrast, say Apache has no public plans, to my knowledge, as of yesterday, to actually support XSLT 2.0. So that is to say that just generally understanding, or at least recalling that there's this internal process, can at least give you some hints as to what makes a wise decision as to what to rely on and what you can expect will be, say, in a standard form, say, in the 12 months for which your software is actually relevant or needs to actually work reliably. So when XML has been around not terribly long itself, was finally uh, crafted by the W3C, say in the late 1990s. They formed their own working group back in 1996. These kinds of details, certainly not in and of themselves interesting, but these 10 goals that the W3C set forth to themselves are actually rather telling. And they're certainly easy to make fun of over the course of the semester for reasons that will hopefully become appreciable even in a sort of techy, geeky kind of sense. So one, XML shall be straightforwardly usable over the internet, pretty compelling. XML shall support a wide variety of applications. XML shall be compatible with SGML, which is a much scarier version of the same idea of a meta language for other languages. It shall be easy to write programs which process XML documents. That was quite well satisfied. The number of optional features in XML is to be kept to the absolute minimum, ideally zero. XML documents should be human legible and reasonably clear. This too, on face value, it doesn't seem to be all that compelling, but the fact that XML is human readable, whether you're using it for remote procedure calls, configuration files, the fact of the matter is that is actually a useful thing, especially when you're implementing a program, a piece of software that's actually making network calls. The being able to very clearly see without having to write your own debugging software what's going across the wire, frankly, is a useful thing indeed. You pay the price. And in fact, just to push it back to the audience here for a second, what presumably is the price you pay for having everything, say, human readable across the wire? Just thinking in general terms about what it means to make a remote procedure call. Security, security is certainly at issue unless you tunnel it somehow with some secure protocol. Some other? Sorry? Performance. So bug format? Uh, performance. Oh, performance. Performance, absolutely. That, that's really the big kicker with XML is that everything is so bloated because you have not only these angle brackets, but you also have the information between them, which is often quite commonly repeated. Just looking at a typical RSS feed, you have dozens often of instances of just the word item and channel and other such things, which are there and they're useful. But it would be more efficient to use much shorter words. But that's not nearly as human legible. So at least there, the pushback is, well, bandwidth's increasing, CPUs are getting faster, so we can afford to spend a bit more verboseness across the wire. But time will tell um, with your own projects as to whether or not these kinds of uh, certain markup makes sense or if it's actually hurting you overall. But finally, finishing these up, uh, the XML design should be prepared quickly. That's kind of funny, especially if you look at 
the lifespans of most of these documents. The design of XML shall be formal and concise. That much is true, and we'll look at at least one of the specs this year. XML documents shall be easy to create. That's certainly true. And the last one, sort of the funny one, and they got this one uh, quite well implemented. Terseness in XML markup is of minimal importance. And just the sizes of the files we'll deal with at some point in this course are quite testament to the verboseness of it all. Um, so I'm going to wave my hands at some of this, which is there sort of as informative, but at the end of the day, it's probably not all that valuable to know precisely when these languages reach their various statuses, but know at least now that XML is in version 1.0 for the past few years. So let's actually take a look at the how you use XML. So this is, I dare say, a representative XML snippet. And it captures the idea of what kind of data would you say by inference here? What are we looking at, perhaps? Yeah, it's some kind of book order. So this is some XML file that maybe Amazon transmitted across the wire when I bought this item from, say, one of their third-party retailers online to you know, buy it at a discount. Maybe this is how Amazon actually lets me interface with their own API. Um, at the end of the day, it does seem to be, though, some kind of purchase order. And it contains information on who it was sold to, <coughs> um, what the item was, the price was, and so forth. So this is the easy stuff. Let's get some of the nomenclature out of the way just so that we can assume certain basics. None of them hard. At the top there is what we'll generally know, uh, describe henceforth, as an element. So in the world of HTML, which is, is also an assumption the course makes that you're familiar with, we would call this an open tag or start tag. This would be a close tag or end tag. Well, in XML speak, everything inside of that tag is what we'll know as an element. If you sort of visualize the same hierarchical document as a tree, with the root of that tree being an order node, well, that node effectively constitutes an element. And that element, in turn, has what we call children or child elements. So the first child of order seems to be sold to because I've very cleanly indented things here. But like in HTML, that's purely for humans' benefit, not the computers. We seem to have a second child here called sold on and a third child. And we'll get into this craziness in the weeks to come. If you actually consider white space to be interesting and worthy of recognition, you also have various new line characters, backslash n's and backslash t's, which will cause all of us uh, great angst over time as you sort of figure out how to deal with white space. Another one of these simple things, but uh, we'll, we'll play with the nuances thereof. So teasing apart a bit more nomenclature. This then is the name of the element, but frankly call it a tag and really nothing's lost. No, clarity is not lost. This is an attribute identical to the speak in HTML, in XHTML. And this is the value of that element there. This stuff we're going to call text. XML is not all that hard thus far. And then we are also tossed in these terms like uh, start tags and end tags. So that's just meant to be a representative document. What's more interesting is what you can do with these standardized file formats. So this is simply a elucidation of this idea of extensibility. So this essentially is the same file, but what I've gone ahead and done here is extend the format. So everything here is copied from the previous version, but what I've done was add some additional metadata, but, and this is really what's compelling in the first place, without breaking the original structure. And for tonight's purposes, suffice it to say that if I ran this file through my same XML parser and my same software, so long as I configured my parser in the right way, that is without validation, my code would continue to function. It would just out of the box, though, ignore this initial, this address, this street, this number, city, state. I don't need to go back in and change my code at all. And that alone can certainly for some applications and some developers be compelling. So who cares? Why use this stuff? at all. So there are many answers to the reason why, and hopefully you as a student, if you, um, if you dive into a course like this, will come up with your own reasons, yay or nay, as to where XML is most useful. But one of the off-sided motivations for XML is to separate content from presentation. And this is sort of the, the, the goal or the, um, 
And this is sort of the ideal in web publishing, for instance, where you want to keep all of your actual data, your content, separate from any of the aesthetics related to, say, the display of that data on your website. So one among the things we'll look at early in the semester is the use of XSLT, Extensible Style Sheet Transformation Language, which is similar in spirit, but much more sophisticated than CSS, which many of you might be familiar with. So if you're familiar with CSS, you know that you can use it to modify the appearance of HTML elements. Well, XSLT in really simplified form allows you to control the aesthetics, the display of XML elements. So that's sort of an analogy. But XSLT, unlike CSS, is actually a functional programming language and it allows you to implement logic, business logic and control flow and that certainly is not something that CSS allows you to do. CSS is much more about the aesthetics and locations of things in a page. XSLT is an actual language that happens to be formatted in what we now know as an XML format. So one of the projects in fact in the course is project two where we focus on this idea of teasing content apart from presentation. Among other things we will hand you a, an XML based database for a bunch of movies. Uh, movies have titles and actors and ratings and descriptions and prices and such and we're going to hand you this data in the form of an XML file and it will be left to you to generate an HTML based view of that data using this language we'll see called XSLT. Clearly then dividing where the data is and where the logic is that generates all of the aesthetics. And by the aesthetics I mean the font tag and the BR tags and all those silly things that actually render the data in a human readable form in a web browser. But we'll do this and create what we've dubbed um, my Blockbuster, which will essentially be a very simple web page that displays this movie based information in HTML form. Then we'll take things one step further in that same project too. We will hand you an even bigger database in the form of a big XML file that contains all geographic information, all location and name information, color information, connection information for all of London, England's tubes, trams and trains. In this file then will be specifications of where all of the London Underground stops are and where they are geographically, what they connect to and such. And your task in this part of the assignment will be to render that same information, that much larger data set, using the same language, XSLT, but then to take it one step further and render that same information graphically using yet another derivative of XML called SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. So not only will you generate a HTML based view of this transit information, similar in spirit to the MBTA's website, though hopefully a bit more straightforward and less buggy if you've ever used their new website, but also generate a graphical view using this graphical language known as SVG. So that at the end of the day, you'll actually be generating uh, TIFFs or PINGs or GIFs or JPEGs of the London Underground and the related transit systems maps, but geographically. Um, accurate. And you'll be doing this all with just XML data and the logic control of this language called XSLT. So that's in project two. So to summarize in project one, and again I'm spoiling something we're about to come up to, project one, you'll get your hands dirty with the innards of a, an actual XML parser that you'll complete the implementation of. In project two, you'll dabble in XSLT predominantly client side with both this My Blockbuster application and also what we've dubbed Xtube. Project three will be about Wahoo that web-based portal in Project 4 will be about uh, Scamazon, the so-called um, e-commerce oriented site that you yourself will implement. Well, why else use XML besides this uh, separation ideally of content versus presentation? Well, this too is a sort of a simple idea, but the fact that XML is so simple and so many tools exist that rely on it makes solving problems like this arguably easier for those of you who work within organizations that just have a lot of legacy code and a lot of legacy systems that somehow have to interact maybe with each other but also with new applications it's a useful thing not to have to hire consultants to come in and essentially write specialized hooks to connect whatever the new in application is maybe some billing server or whatever it is your company needs to rely on to each of your old legacy systems. The sort of ideal and one of the value adds, so to speak, offered by XML or anything like it, similar in spirit, is that if you at least simply write hooks 
for XML support, both in your own applications and then also in this new application. Once you have applications speaking a common language, it doesn't matter what it is and whether it's the perfect language or not, the fact that they're all speaking the same language, something XML based, can often similarly save development time and integration time. So again, to be clear and to try myself to stay away from some of the hype, dare say none of these reasons is in and of themselves compelling, but when you sort of stack it all up and again see what kinds of tools and libraries exist out there today, it becomes at least uh, an option to consider when actually having to implement software from the ground up or interface with some older stuff. This is perhaps some of the coolest stuff. And these two are problems that have long been solved by other technologies, other languages, but XML has taken its own spin on them, again, using these same tools and such. So in the past, we've long had support for this idea of RPCs, remote procedure calls. Many of them, though, have been either proprietary or language specific. So if you're familiar with such things as COM, DCOM, in the Windows world, CORBA, uh, Java, RMI, all of these protocols or languages solve the problem of letting someone here execute code here, aka remote procedure calls. But they're often tied to specific platforms or languages. What we'll see with, in this world of web services toward the course's end is that using things like SOAP or REST or XML RPC, you can implement the same idea, make calls here that actually get executed here, but you can do it using a language of your choice. You like PHP, you're writing a PHP website, then download or generate the PHP versions of the stubs that, say, Amazon supports by way of what we described as a WSDL file before. You prefer Java, your application's in Java, fine. Call, invoke those same methods via Java. C Sharp developer, same code, invoke it via C Sharp. So it's just this flexibility that also is potentially compelling. And again, much like RSS has sort of become this very popular standard for doing simple things like transferring news, again, increasingly you see popular websites like Amazon exposing their own functionality and data sets by way of XML-based languages because they allow everyone to sort of meet in the middle um, and use whatever tools and languages they're most inclined to use in the first place. All right. Any questions on XML or these things? Yeah. Sure. Mm hmm. Okay. Mm hmm. Okay. Sure. So it's it's a really good question, and just to summarize for our folks tuning in from home, at what point does do performance concerns really become an issue? And the example you just offered was if you have if you're just querying for individual stock tickers every day that's perhaps not such a big deal because it's fairly small requests and responses. But suppose you're doing a comparative analysis for data from the past 10 years, all of a sudden we're probably talking about kilobytes, megabytes of information that need to either be loaded into memory or shipped across the wire. So I can respond in that in a few ways. We will see different ways of getting at XML-based data, uh, initially in the form of SACs and DOM, the former of which is meant to be a quick and dirty API to XML, uh, fire and forget is sort of a, a phrase that we'll use in next week's lecture, whereby the data comes through your software once and you have one and one and only chance to grab the data you want before it sort of passes you by, so, so to speak. By contrast, DOM is going to construct a huge in-memory representation of that same data and hand you the whole data set. So their RAM implications are much more significant. And so among the issues we'll consider in early in the course are which APIs make sense and when. And presumably it depends on the developer and arbitrary uh, perhaps requirements that the project itself has as to where that line is. But what we'll do in this course really is at least in, um, introduce the ideas and sort of empower you with the questions to ask as, so that you can answer that on a per project basis. Um, one other answer to this question of performance is that it's not as bad as it seems. For instance, 
Most of this XML-based transference of data these days is being done over common protocols, HTTP being perhaps the most common one. Well, if you're running this on any popular web server, say like Apache, most of these web servers come these days or can be configured with things like mod gzip, which for those unfamiliar is simply a module that many web browsers, i.e. Firefox support, whereby Web pages themselves, or even XML data, when transferred from A to B, first gets zipped up, essentially, or tarred up, or gzipped up, sent across the wire, and then unzipped at the other end. In fact, Internet Explorer and Firefox are probably doing this many times a day with some of today's most popular websites. The fact that XML data then is text-based, and there's so much conformity within the document itself, generally means it compresses well. So yes, it's big but it also compresses well. And if your network is your bottleneck more than your CPU is, then it's not as big a concern because yes, these large data sets can first be compressed, then sent across the wire, decompressed in a manner that's perhaps, that wasn't possible say five, 10 years ago where the CPU performance really would have hurt you for trying something like that. So again, in this course, there's never gonna be, I think, an easy answer. Like in this case, use A, in this case, use B, but we'll at least teach the ideas that you could be, should be thinking about and the questions you should be asking. And these are some of the most interesting ones, I think, to be honest, especially when you're implementing real world software. Other questions? Yeah. Ah, okay. So when should you use an XML element or an XML attribute? So we'll actually come back to this next week um, when we look at some of the things we've breezed over today in more detail. But essentially the rule of thumb, and I'll give this context, is that using an element tends to make sense when you might in the future want extensibility. Using an attribute makes sense if you have a very a piece of uh, an atomic piece of data that just doesn't make sense to conceptually extend in the future, an ID number being a canonical example. It's hard to imagine taking one, two, three and adding any additional meta information around it. I mean, you could break it up into one and two and three, but with one, two, three. Oh, so there too. So would you want to extend last name and first name? Perhaps not. I could have put that into an attribute, uh, two attributes. So the question, to be clear, is last name, first name. Should they just have been new attributes or should they be these so-called child elements? What you'll appreciate more in the weeks to come is that part of these decisions aren't necessarily governed entirely by intuition but rather the API. So the fact of the matter is, SACS, for instance, actually makes it much easier to get at attributes than it does to get at child elements. And as such, one's inclination might be to make everything attributes because the API just lends itself to that. By contrast, XPath and XQuery and DOM make it very easy to get at child elements, they're say easier, for reasons that relate to validation of data and exactly how much control you can impose on elements as opposed to, say, attributes with, say, DTD. Um, and so there, too, um, the most obvious answer might not be the correct one given how you're going to be uh, interfacing with the data. So that question will address it outright over time, but uh, you yourself, I think, will appreciate what the trade-offs are when you actually start using the APIs themselves. Yeah. Good, good question. So does XML, let's say, require that elements appear in a particular order? Short answer is it depends. Uh, generally speaking, yes, order is important, not of attributes, but of elements. And this, too, is something we'll tease apart more in weeks two and three. However, using XML schema, which is this other language that I mentioned earlier with which to define a file format, you can actually relax that requirement and say, I want first name to be there, I want last name to be there, but I, the human, I, the developer, don't care in what order it comes, just make sure it's there. So schema, we'll see, is much more expressive than DTD and can solve, address exactly those kinds of questions. Yeah. C data. C data, which do we have in this example here? Nope. So C data simply means character data. This is in contrast with something we'll define next week to be PC data, 
which is parsed character data. The difference being if you want to include essentially escape characters of sorts or dangerous tokens, things that come to mind are actually including this character in your actual data. The obvious concern being it looks just like the uh, angled brackets you're using for metadata. Um, you can put such things in what are called C data sections, which means it's text, but it should not be parsed per se by the prop parser. It should just blindly run over it without interpreting any of the data. By contrast, almost everything is by contrast PC data. So anything that's pure text here, like JK Rowling, Harry Potter, and that dot 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 is what's called PC data because the parser will actually parse it. And we'll see what that means in the future, but in general that means things like Entities, as you may recognize from, say, HTML, or perhaps more familiar, are things like uh, LT for less than or NBSP. If one of these kinds of things is in a C data section, it goes through unchanged. If it's in a PC data section, the, par the parser will generally convert that to its equivalent. In the case of uh, LT, it will convert it to something like this and then hand you the result. So that's essentially the difference. But again, we'll come back to this next week. Yep. <coughs> Okay. Uh, Did you say Web 2? Web 2.0? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Web 2.0 is one of these stupid words that like marketing folks come up with as opposed to actual technical people and it's as though someone invented some new technology. Web 2.0 essentially describes a website whose content is largely user driven. So as such, and if I wanted to sex up the catalog description, I could probably say that our, a lot of our projects are Web 2.0 compliant. Um, it's sort of meaningless. All it means is these sites like, uh, I guess, Facebook and MySpace and Dig and these kinds of sites that not only have information being pushed at users, but also being pulled from users or pushed by users to the sites are Web 2.0 because no longer is there one authority updating the site but thousands of people. Wikipedia is the, perhaps the canonical example of this. So in that sense, if you actually have a large family or a large group of friends who will be testing out the projects that you implement for this course, then yes, you have uh, made something on the web 2.0. Um, beyond that, I think I would just be, we'd be making fun of ourselves if we tried to apply it too much, to be honest. But you can add it to your resume. If you've already made an interactive website, you know Web 2.0. And apparently, some, a friend of mine mentioned Web 3.0 today, and I called him on that, too. And I was like, what the heck is this? Um, and I'm sure some, someone, one of my consulting friends will tell me at some point what Web 3.0 is. So other questions? Anything at all? No? OK. So some of the logistical matters and what to expect from the course <coughs> itself. So again, these prerequisites, and by all means, I'll stick around after we adjourn tonight to answer more personal questions about your level of comfort and savvy, but those are the official um, prerequisites specified in the catalog. What are the expectations? To attend or watch all of the lectures, and all of them, even if you are local to Cambridge but can't make it to campus some night, are welcome to tune in um, from home via the uh, videos on the web. Uh, complete four assigned projects, all of which I touched upon tonight. And finally, design and implement a final project. And it's the final project in this course that's really the culmination of the several weeks of work in which you'll be largely uh, encouraged to choose any sort of project, even if it plays nicely with something you already want to do or need to do at work. If you would like to try to tie the two together, by all means, that's fine, so long as out of that experience comes a learning process or an application of the kinds of ideas we introduced this course. If you're able to kill two birds with one stone, I mean, that's sort of why you're here in the first place, presumably, to actually apply this knowledge. So what better way to do that if you actually have some real-world problems that you'd like to try out some of your newfound savvy and skills on. The specification for pro the final project is already released uh, in the form of one of tonight's six handouts. Uh, by no means do you need to come to next week's lecture with a project idea in mind. We simply put it out there so that as the course progresses and as you see new things and new assigned projects, maybe some ideas will begin to come to mind. But we set a number of milestones forth in this document so that we will have a regimented schedule associated with it, but that's for in many weeks from now to come. 
Grades. Just so you know, this too is in the syllabus, which is one of tonight's other handouts for projects, final project. The grades are, uh, the final grades will be computed entirely on this basis. There's no midterm or final exam in the course. The graded work is only these five aspects, and the final project will simply be weighted 50% more than any of the individual projects. So it will thus be expected that the final project does take a bit more time, but is presumably and usually more fun for students because they themselves get to guide exactly what it is they're working on. To give you a sense of where we're going in the course, a rough sketch of the um, agenda, next week we'll dive headfirst into XML itself more precisely and SACS, one of those programmatic APIs. Week three we'll look at DOM, which is this tree-based approach to XML data. And lectures four and five we'll look at two of the most popular tools or languages for accessing XML, namely XPath which is a query language that lets you take an XML document and grab aspects of it that you're interested in using hierarchical-like paths, and XSLT, which is that truly functional programming language that I've mentioned several times thus far. Lecture six, we'll look at SVG and XSLFO. Uh, lecture seven, will begin our marked transition to things server-side, introducing some of the basics of HTTP, cookie handling and such, which will allow us to use things like sessions, if you're familiar with them already from other domains, and JSP and Java servlet. We'll look in lecture eight at another query language called XQuery and the first of our schema-oriented languages, DTD. XML schema will tease apart in nine and 10. And in, web in lectures 11 and 12, we'll introduce web services formally. In lecture 13, we will introduce Ajax formally, which is perhaps the sexiest of the topics in the syllabus these days, in that it seems to be everywhere. And some of the coolest sites on the web today, frankly, are things like Google Maps and say kayak.com. And anytime you've seen an interface that one is not flash-based, but that nonetheless has this dynamism whereby somehow the content of the page is updating itself without any page reload proper happening and or you moving away from the page to another URL, it's likely using this, um, this suite of tools called AJAX, which used to be all capitals because it used to be XML based, but increasingly is AJAX not XML based, but say JavaScript based. So we'll introduce a bit of JavaScript at this point, the XML deployment of it, JSON, J-S-O-N, which is what's increasingly replacing XML, but it's very much in the spirit of creating these interactive server side products um, that may or may not themselves need to be XML based. And in lecture 14, we shall conclude. Let's go ahead at this point, since we are ultimately governed by the tape. Let's take a five minute break, and when we regroup, we'll probably spend about 10, 15 minutes more, and then I'll linger with four individual questions. And certainly during this break, come on up now. I'll put on some more of that soothing music. Logistically, bathrooms are that. All right. To finish up with some of the overview and logistics. I spoiled this along the way, the four projects that will be involved in the course. The first of them is also already distributed. Uh, know that this is, we don't expect that you even dive into this until at least after next week's lecture, but typically know that the trajectory for the course is as follows. You'll typically have about three weeks for each of the projects. Um, we are not very forgiving when it comes to extensions, but look to the syllabus for the precise policy simply because there is um, certainly historically ample time to do these so long as the students plan accordingly. These are not the sorts of projects, as you might infer from a 17-page specification, that you should be picking up the night before it's due, frankly. Um, with that said, they are intended to be very precise. And they're long only because of the precision with which we tend to specify exactly what's expected. Moreover, at the ends of these documents, what you will find are appendices. And these appendices essentially allow you to configure your machines in a way that allows you to work on your own machines, whether it's a Linux box, Mac, Mac OS machine, or Windows machine. But I'll come back to that in a moment when I make mention of uh, Harvard's own Linux-based infrastructure, on which will at least require that you submit the same work. So more on that in just a moment. The final project does have four milestones that I mentioned earlier, a pre-proposal, which will be your opportunity, and all of these are spelled out in more detail in the syllabus, to sort of seed each other as well as yourself with some possible ideas. Know that collaboration is allowed on the final project with, say, a class meet that you might meet over the next few months. A proposal where you very precisely spe specify or predict what it is you'll be working on 
to the teaching staff and then we'll reply with a yay or nay or request for modifications to your proposal or perhaps some warnings that we think you might be biting off more than you might be able to chew in the weeks allocated for but you do have more time on the order of a week or more for the final project versus the actual four projects. Quick status report, which is really our attempt to help you help yourselves by making you email us a short and sweet note as to where things stand. That's usually enough of a, a nudge to make sure you actually have something to report at that point in the process. And then finally, the implementation and documentation, which is due literally at the last possible day during the Extension School's fall calendar, which is sometime in January. So know that you'll have some time over break, so to speak, or the traditional college break if you so choose. Again, no exams in this course, no pop quizzes, no tests along those lines. The focus is entirely on the implementation of these projects. So what about books? So there are no required books for the course. I think that far superior and far less expensive alternatives exist online. And what we hope you make frequent use of is the course's website, which I'll give you a rapid tour of in just a moment to point out what's hopefully most useful for the semester to come. However, if you're the type of student who it appreciates having a book by your side, either as a reference or as a crutch or just really as a, 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 an added comfort when you don't have, say, lectures and sections before you, know that these four books we find to be generally quite good. The first one is an off-sited uh, text related to Java Server and Java Servlets, essentially server-side J2EE oriented software development. Know, however, that a free version of this book exists in PDF form on the web, and you, we link to it via the course's website. Certainly not a book you need to think about for at least six or seven weeks, but just know that it's out there. The middle two books are really meant to be references slash tutorials on most things XML. There's no one book that covers everything that the course covers, but those two in particular cover a lot of things like DTD, XML, XSLT, and a lot of the most popular languages, but they too are by no means necessary. And many online free resources exist, but if you're the type who benefits from books, by all means flip through either or both of those at a bookstore or online to get a sense if you think you would like having a text like this. Finally, and in answer to your question as to if you got to choose among the four and you just feel like you need to buy a book, you want to buy the right one, um, it's the last one that I would recommend is the most valuable reference. And of the four books, I'm not sure where my copies of the first three are these days, but I do make sure to know where the fourth one is for this, this course every semester because it's perhaps the best reference book. It's written by a man named Michael Kay who's been involved in a number of the W3C drafts. He has his own implementation of what we'll know as XSLT uh, called Saxon, even though we'll rely more on the Apache versions of those software products. Um, and it's just a wonderful resource and a wonderful reference. Alternatives for that exist too on the web, but even I find that book to be helpful in particular. The gotcha though is this. I believe his book is now up to third edition, though I've been recommending the second edition because the second edition focuses on what's known as version 1.0 of XSLT. Version 2.0 has now been out for about a year, and this is something we'll, uh, you may better appreciate in a couple weeks when we cover that material. But support, as I said, for XSLT2 is slim. Michael Kay's own Saxon product, which is freely available, does support it. But sort of the canon out there, the Apache software and what ships with the Sun JDK doesn't support it. And the last time I read, has no plans to support it. So I'm sort of wary of relying on material that may not be useful to your own actual deployments of these ideas. So We'll try to play this by ear, but I don't foresee any widespread movement to support XSLT during the year. So what I'm going to suggest is that if you must get one of these books, don't go to the coop for this last one, but rather go on Amazon from one of those third-party sellers. You can buy the book probably for 5 10 20 bucks anyway and get intentionally the older version only because the division between what's well-supported and what's not yet quite well-supported at least will be more clear. Though. XSLT2 is essentially a superset of XSLT1, so you'll get all the same information in third edition, but you might find yourself coding up solutions that rely on features that your own processor doesn't support. So that's the tension. And this is why we introduced that life cycle of the W3C and just give you a sense of the speed at which this world works, because it has real world implications when it comes time to implement this stuff. Uh, nice.fas.harvard.edu. 
So to be clear, and the syllabus specifies this as well, all of the work that you submit in the form of those projects for the course must compile on and execute on nice.fas.harvard.edu, which is a, a Linux cluster to which you will connect via SSH or SFTP. No need to do this just yet. We'll introduce this to those of you unfamiliar in the weeks to come when it becomes, uh, when it becomes necessary to interface with it. But essentially, you use a traditional terminal window or something to that effect to control your own FAS account, so to speak, on one of Harvard's server clusters. Uh, Project One and the course's syllabus explicitly explains how you go about obtaining one of these so-called FAS accounts if you don't already have one. So do take care. That is the aspect of Project One that you can bite off over this coming week. When you actually start seeing buzzwords like SACS and DOM, you can put the document down and trust that we'll get to that next week. However, you are welcome, if not encouraged, to do most, if not all, of the work for this course on your own machine. And I would say historically, many, dare say most students, do work on their own machines, either because they don't like a command line interface, it's a pain constantly uploading files back and forth. And the nice thing about the world in which we're about to live for the next few months is that almost every tool and software program and library we'll be using is platform independent. And that alone was one of the motivations for all of this stuff in the first place. So very common in this course is for students to use, say, Eclipse or other popular um, uh, IDEs for developing Java code when the projects call for Java code. Uh, using the build.xml files we'll provide to you, which is the config file for a program called Ant. More on that to come. Um, and developing on their own Macs, PCs, or Linux boxes. The only gotcha is that when you upload your Java files and such, you have to still run them on the NICE server and make sure they compile. But in theory, if you configure your machine as we prescribe in these appendices, it should just work. And it often does, but it's not the sort of thing also that you want to leave to the last hour before the deadline to test, because inevitably a student uploads something and they've hard-coded in D colon backslash somewhere. That's not generally a good idea. So uh, you may meet him tonight. Um, if not, we will introduce him virtually. But the, uh, virtually, but the course's teaching fellow, Mahesh, was actually a former student and was a huge fan of using Eclipse. So one of the upsides of having Mahesh rejoin us this year as a teaching fellow is that he really likes to create the Eclipse config files to give to other people that make it even easier to deploy this stuff on your own computer. So know that and take. Um, advantage of, perhaps if you'd like, of these appendices that essentially explain for each project what you need to download and what you need to install on your own machine to make it look and or behave like this Linux cluster. So, um, and certainly uh, speak with each other via what you'll see in a moment, the course's listserv, whenever configuration issues and those kinds of things come up. It's often, if one of you is running into a, a stumbling block of sorts technically, probably someone else had the same tech support issue. So the course's website uh, is at that address, or perhaps easier to type, or at least to remember, especially if you're not a fan of tildes, is computerscience259.org. No, not or, dot org. We'll simply redirect to that site if you like to save a few keystrokes, though admittedly not terribly many. This is the course's website. So what is up there? First and foremost, any handouts that I ever physically give out in lecture will always be on the course's website, either before or right after lecture. Videos of lectures will also be available on the course's website, usually probably 48, 72 hours after each lecture. They'll go online in at least real video formats and possibly others like flash format. Simply follow the lectures link. You'll be able to check your grades online via the appropriate link, download the projects, and each of the projects comes with its own distribution code. So we typically give you frameworks or testing harnesses or those kinds of things with the project. So typically, as you've seen tonight, you'll have a project specification, the directions essentially, and then I'll typically, so that you can mock it, mark it up when sitting down in sections or at home, a printout of most, if not all, of the source code so that you can really get a, an aggregate sense of what you're diving into. So for instance, this is the distribution code that comes with project one, and this is the specification. And uh, you can also download the source code itself, not as a printout, obviously, but as the raw source files. What we'll do after each project is submitted and graded by us is generally post 
one or more students sort of representative solutions. We'll ask your permission before certainly exhibiting your work on the course's website, but what we try to do every three weeks is recognize particularly good or particularly illustrative work from one or more students in the course so that other students, if inclined or interested, can see how someone else tackled the same problem. And especially if your code wasn't quite up to snuff or maybe didn't quite work, you can see how someone solved a particular problem. Let me take this moment, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the front, I need you to stand near my microphone. Introduce the course's teaching fellow, if you'd like to take a moment in your own words to say hello and say a bit about you and your experience in the course and such. Sure. I was taking the class in the G130, just sneaking over here for a minute. Mahesh Chalil, I took the course last semester. Is it last semester? Mm -hmm. It's last semester. A wonderful course, actually, and I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy it. All the projects are wonderful. And it will definitely give you an in-depth knowledge about XML and you know, Java. So whatever doubt you know you have, I'll be working with David to resolve it. So I'm always available over the email or in any case of emergency via phone all the time. And I live in the street, so please. Okay. And the things that's worth uh, worth my noting now is um, what we will typically do in terms of support structure for the course is as follows. Either Mahesh or I will stick around after lectures, even though it's a little late at night this semester, and generally hold either a Q&A session or a physical section on campus where we give code walkthroughs verbally pointing out exactly where you might want to begin your focus for the current problem set, how you want to go about tackling it. We'll generally record those sessions, typically via MP3s and audios, put those on the website for those of you tuning in from home. But also in one of the wonderful additions of Mahesh's role in the course this semester is to offer that same kind of support virtually. So we're essentially going to be dabbling in a couple of experiments ourselves this semester, which I myself have tried out in other courses with, with quite good success, we're, we're happy to say thus far. What I mean by that is that both Mahesh and I will be offering on some schedule to be announced on the course's website what we've dubbed a virtual office hours in the course's so-called virtual classroom. For now, just know that this is essentially sophisticated chat room-like software where we can instant message with you back and forth, but with the value add that we'll be able to observe or share control of one or more of win the windows on your computer screen. So I hate to describe it like this, but think like Dell tech support meets academia. So for a course like this, which is very much keyboard uh, based in the first place, in which a lot of the Q&A historically that goes across the wire, which has traditionally been email, is ultimately about looking at a student's code and suggesting where the bug might be and providing them with a bit of pseudocode. And so what worked wonderfully well for us this past summer with another distance course at Harvard Summer School with my co-lecturer and myself, Henry Leitner, we did exactly this process with our own uh, introductory to, uh, introduction to Java students and it worked well enough technologically, and we don't claim responsibility for the software. Some other smarter people implemented the software commercially, and Harvard has site licensed it. We were able, honestly, to work with one of our most distant students in China by sharing control of her computer on multiple occasions and really just helping her work through some of the technical issues she had, some of the bugs in her code, and we hope to bring that same sort of support structure to this course. And in addition, what Mahesh will be doing each week is offering a virtual section, and we're going to this is a feature that we're going to experiment with over the next several weeks and figure out how best to sort of present a section, a recitation, if you will, in an online forum. And your feedback will be very much encouraged during this process, but essentially Mahesh will be leading online sections that any number of you are welcome to tune into, whether you're physically here or physically quite far away. But just know that those support structures will be in place in addition to email and say more traditional electronic means. So it should be a lot of fun, I think, for us and interesting, certainly, to get your feedback on these things over the semester, since at the end of the day, it's only there to, to help you and make your experience in the course better and easier. So we'll, we shall see if we can satisfy those goals. Any questions for either of us in, on these kinds of issues? OK, well, you have to run back to your own class, I'm sure. So we will uh, hear more from you soon. We will, sections themselves in these virtual office hours will begin most likely sometime next week. So we'll announce those either at lecture next Monday 
or via email. And that's hopefully a perfect segue to this, which is the course's address. That address will go to both Mahesh and myself. This is meant for questions that are certainly personal in nature or in which you want to share code with us in a more static email-based format as opposed to what we'll describe as virtual office hours. But the direction we'd like to push you generally is toward the course's listserv, which we've used for a number of years um, to allow other students to benefit from the questions you yourself have. And let me just decree right now, there is never a stupid question on the listserv. And even if there is, Mahesh and I will keep it to ourselves. Um, the listserv is essentially an email list that you are encouraged to subscribe to via the directions in Project One and on the course's website already. Uh, that essentially is an open forum for student-initiated questions, for staff-initiated announcements. And we do encourage you to just put your questions out there, but certainly stop short of the line where academic honesty starts to come into play. Posting your code and saying, David, Mahesh, and everyone else, what's wrong with my code? crosses that line. But simply sharing tidbits of code or especially configuration issues, asking conceptual questions, all of that stuff is certainly encouraged to go out on the list so that others can benefit as well. And those of you who already get too many emails per day can subscribe if you wish in digest mode or just browse the archives online so that you can pull the information when you want it rather than having every email go to your inbox. But you'll hopefully find that both Mahesh and I are quite responsive when it comes to email because we know for those of you tuning in from home, it's a, it's a challenge enough taking a class remotely. Um, it's even more so when you never seem to hear back. So we will both try to be quite good. Um, Mahesh, not, one of the reasons, frankly, Mahesh got the job this year was that he sometimes replied more quickly to stud other students' questions last year as a student himself than I did. So uh, I, I, you, it can only be a good thing to actually pay him to do that this coming year. So we shall see. Um, let me toss this out there just so that we've made um, mention of it, but do look at the syllabus for such issues as these. And this last point I want to emphasize wholeheartedly. So mentioned also on the course's website is this invitation to proactively mention via email or voice to Mahesh and myself what's going on out there. Inevitably there's some new version of a tool that we've been preaching or using in the course. Inevitably one of you will learn that there's XSLT 3.0 one day before we learn of it and so tell us that. Help us keep the website up to date and such so that we are in fact um, pushing forth the most current information and that's particularly apropos in a course like this because this stuff even more than other stuff in IT does tend to change fairly quickly. Certainly versions of stuff. And so the last things you should take note of then on the course's website are perhaps the two, we hope, most useful links in addition to the archives of handouts and such, namely the resources link and the software link. Any time you need to download a piece of software, you don't need to start Googling for the stuff that we advise you to grab in the appendices and such. Start with the course's website. And as best we can, we've linked directly to what you need. So you'll waste, ideally, no more than a couple of seconds finding what you need and none of this uh, futzing through uh, pages and pages of misleading information. So all of the software that's germane to the course is hyperlinked here. Some of it is commercial and site licensed for you, so you may have to log in per the directions at the top of the page. If you're not able to log in, it probably just means our database is out of sync with the registrar, so email us and we'll make sure we get the freshest data. Uh, some of it is, most of it is simply freely available. And as for those free resources, the best place to turn for some tutorials, for some references, for some information, besides us as, as staff, are the links we've provided here. And long as the list is, we've also tried to keep it focused on what we think are the best resources out there. And some of the most common links clicked, even by myself during the term, are these APIs, Javadoc, essentially, for a lot of the libraries that we'll be making use of, but also quite useful when we get to it, are things like under XSLT, looking at, for instance, the W3C recommendation, which is not going to be a frequent activity, but sometimes the most definitive answer to your questions is going to come from the references, the recommendations themselves. And initially, Mahesh and I will probably sift through the arcane language to find those answers, but increasingly as term progresses, we'll point you at those same resources so that come term's end, you yourselves know where to find these answers when, uh, when Mahesh and I are no longer responding quite quickly to your emails and such. Yeah. Oh, are they? 
Okay, good. So brownie points already. Go ahead and if I forget, just go ahead and drop me an email and I will double check all of our links again. It's, it's, it's tough to stay on top of some of them. But essentially, a great number of resources exist here that are all freely available on this page and are meant to be compelling alternatives, certainly to an investment in any uh, paper-based books these days. So any questions whatsoever? Yes? Okay, good question. Um, how many hours to plan for the projects? I would say that a safe bound is to spend 10 hours per week on this course outside. That's probably an overestimate. I would say that you know, five to seven hours per week or maybe 10 to 20 one week is reasonable. I think the best person to ask might be Mahesh himself either over email or at next Monday's class. But I would say we expect yeah, for a typical student, no more than 10 hours per week. So that's uh, you know a couple evenings during the week, maybe uh, part of a weekend day and an evening a week. So it's definitely manageable. And this is why we spread the deadlines out over three weeks. And what we do in the lectures is introduce essentially with each lecture a third of the content covered by each of the projects so that essentially after each lecture you can go bite off another third of the project so that you can pace yourself just by keeping step with the lectures as opposed to waiting until the last week and trying to do it all. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, so do you have any say on the day or time of the sections? We'll do our best to accommodate because it's a relatively small class and there's relatively few of us and we certainly do take input as best we can. Some of it boils down to logistics but also the feedback we get from you. So we will do our best to accommodate either by solicitation of feedback over the listserv, maybe a piece of paper next week, but we'll do our best. Um, what it typically boils down to for the in-person stuff is just for logistical reasons so that folks don't have to truck to campus multiple times is we just say we're going to do the in-person audio Q&A code walkthroughs right after class and sometimes I'll try to finish lecture a bit earlier to make more time for that but the fact is for most of our students they tend to prefer staying a bit later one night a week rather than coming in two nights a week so we tend in the past few years to just do everything at once um, and try to satisfy as many people as possible but never everyone other questions mm -hmm. Yeah, so personally, I've never been a fan of the O'Reilly series. And so the only books that I've been quite comfortable saying, I like these books, go with these, are those four. There are so many others, and a lot of them are just not worth the money they charge. And there are books out there on XML this thick, which is just laughable, frankly, that, that you're able to explode open bracket, close bracket into a 500 page book. With that said, Michael Kay's book is fairly long, but it is nonetheless a wonderful reference and we've tried to filter out all of the stuff on board or shelf and the only four I'm quite happy recommending are these four, though there are probably other compelling alternatives out there. Other questions? Yeah. Is there anything you should start reading before the next class? If you would like, and you're the sort of student who prefers to read ahead rather than to read up after the fact, you might want to browse some of the links on our resources page related to SACS and XML, since those are the two topics on next week's agenda. But by no means is that expected or required. Um, some students find that useful. Other students find it better to use me as really a filter for that information and then go back and fill in holes or sort of reread from someone else's perspective what we introduced in class. But the projects themselves will be reliant on the information presented in lectures and not expected that you go find some minute detail elsewhere unless it boils down to, say, looking up some other API function, which would just be boring for me to present to you in great detail in lectures. Other questions? All right, let's officially adjourn here, and I will stick around for one-on-one Q&A. See you next week. <laughs>